after the meeting. Um, so you can um, access those later. This is a list of all of the folks that we currently have on the council. We have just about 30 folks, um, um, all data lovers from different sectors in North Carolina. We're glad to have you continue to join us as a part of this, this council. We have a couple new folks who are joining us today. Um, so I just want to mention them briefly. We have Tanya Morgan, um, who's the new ESIDS project manager. I'm not sure how new she is now um, with DHHS. So glad to have her. We also have two folks from the North Carolina Partnership for Children joining us as Krista Kinney is rolling off the council and Spence and Katya Vogla Molitz, um, I hope I got that right, Katya, um, who um, will, one of them will be kind of replacing Krista on the council. So both of them are joining us today to see what we're about. Okay. It's always good to just remind ourselves of the objectives of this council, also for new folks, but for those of us who've been on it for a while. Um, the objectives of what we refer to as ED, ECDAC, the Advisory Council, is to improve the quality and scope of early childhood data in North Carolina, to really advocate for organizations to align their work around the pathways measures of success, as well as the North Carolina Early Childhood Action Plan measures, as well as some of the ESSA measures, ESSA um, plan measures. We really want to, as a group, advocate for better data sharing um, across um, sectors, to provide guidance and feedback to different groups that are doing data and research in the state, to build partnerships with those groups as well as new groups, and to also just serve as ambassadors for ESIDS and the Early Childhood Action Plan measures and pathways. And I'm hoping that this meeting will be able to accomplish some of these objectives. So here is our agenda for um, this meeting and also just wanted to give you a reminder of our last meeting. We last met in February. We heard a lot of great updates for the first half of that meeting. We heard um, from Rob and Christy and Muffy on the child welfare system, um, childcare and NC pre-K data during COVID, some of the economic impact of childcare, some really meaty updates. Um, Mandy, at the end of that meeting, tried to get a discussion started about what might be the path of this council moving forward in 2021, and we're going to really start the agenda there, where Mandy left off, talking about two areas that we um, might work on um, in the next couple months. Um, the first being kind of what some of the next steps are with our data development strategy, um, what measures do we want to work on next? That will be the first thing. The second thing will be to talk about this idea of um, taking a deeper look or writing a report or something on what North Carolina's early childhood data looks like um, during COVID-19. Um, so that's another option. So the first half of the meeting is really going to be a lot more of a working meeting kind of discussion. Um, we'll take a little bit of a break and then we'll have some updates from a guest speaker and some of our council members. We'll have Dr. Ioma Aruka joining us to share on a new report that they completed that's lifting up Black parent voices what they, during what they call the two pandemics of COVID and racism. We'll hear from Dan Tietro and Jenny Wilkinson uh, on the excellent Public Schools Act of 2021, and just like a quick overview about how they're kind of preparing for some of the data requirements for that, and then a kind of hopefully a bigger overview at our next meeting. We'll also hear from Vicki Kress from NC Child about their 2021 county data dashboard, and then we'll end with some next steps. So we're gonna dive in um, just kind of reflecting back on our data development strategy. Um, before we do that, thanks to all of you who are um, adding your names to the chat and things you're looking forward to uh, this summer. Um, it's exciting to read those, it gets me in the spirit. Um, <clears throat> so we have in 2019, the Data Advisory Council um, developed a data development strategy. 
Um, this was before the pandemic. And the goal of this strategy, as you can see here, was um, to help improve North Carolina's early childhood data based on pathways, um, the ECAP targets and sub-targets, and the ESSA um, and ESSA. Um, the data development strategy really looked at kind of where there are gaps in data that we could be working on. And um, we will, um, I think Sumer has already added to the chat a link to that data development strategy if you want to just remind yourself about what was included in that. So in 2020, we decided as a group to um, prioritize uh, two of the measures that were listed in um, the data development strategy. The first one was adult health insurance and then preschool suspension and expulsion. And Mandy worked with a variety of you. We had some conversations during our meetings and outside of the meetings to kind of develop a plan and look at some of the things that we already had in these areas. Um, also some plans that were already in place. And we kind of got to a place where we felt we, were, we had addressed these two measures and we were ready to kind of take on two new measures or however many new measures. So we, um, at our meeting in November and also in a survey that we sent out to you all in January, asked for your input on which me measures we might want to work on next in 2021. And you will see listed here some of the ones that rose to the top in that survey and also just in feedback from the group. And I would say kind of by far the one that kind of most folks had interest in was the measures around affordable high quality childcare. So I'm going to share, we're going to talk a little bit more about those and we're going to decide uh, together as a group today if that's actually where we want to move forward with. So the two measures as outlined in the data development strategy in this area are these two that you see listed here. Um, the estimated eligible children under age six that are receiving childcare subsidies desegregated by race, ethnicity and income. And the second is families paying 10% or less of their income on childcare desegregated by race, ethnicity, income, and age. Um, I believe that the, these are how they're worded in our data development strategy. I think they came from pathways. Um, and I think a big part of this was also to get at the desegregation of the data, um, which I, I don't believe that we currently have in place. And there was a lot of feedback on these measures, and I'll just share kind of what some of the strengths or thoughts people had on why we might want to work on these next. Um, first and foremost, we think that these, these measures are really important um, to kind of move and focus on equity, uh, racial equity in particular, but other areas of equity to really understand how different groups of children and family are impacted in these areas. Um, we also talked about how childcare has a lot of the, the barriers and challenges of childcare have been illuminated by COVID-19 and there will be a lot of opportunities that could come through funding and new work after COVID-19 where this data could be really useful. Um, these are obviously outlined in our data development strategy. They were consider considered kind of short-term measures, so maybe some ones that we could work on more quickly than others. Um, they got the most votes, and um, they also subsidy is an important component of the Leandro plan, um, which is why folks kind of felt these ones might be um, good to move forward on. So these were measures that we identified in 2019, and what we want to what I want to do now is just kind of open the floor for conversation. Any questions or concerns, suggested revisions you have on these measures. Um, before we kind of take a vote on whether we want to move forward with them. Um, so if you don't mind just um, unmuting yourself um, to share any thoughts you have, we will also keep track of any comments in the chat box. So any questions or concerns about move for moving forward with these two measures? All right. Well, hearing none and seeing nothing in the comments, I think we can move forward. One thing I will mention is um, somebody had mentioned to me that um, 
you know, the USDHHS and other groups kind of look at the income level as being families paying 7% or less of their income. Um, you all will know more than me if that's a better kind of goal to set or maybe why it was set at 10. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or feedback on that percentage that we might want to change or we can keep it the same? Okay, hearing none, we're going to just do a very quick little poll and just get your vote and agreement on whether we um, will move forward with these two indicators. So if you just take a minute here and just answer this question. It's kind of a little easier to do consensus by polls than doing thumbs up um, on Zoom. Just give you a few more seconds. Great, we have 100% of the attendees saying, yes, we will move forward with these. Um, so Michelle has asked in the comment here, will the 10% be per child or total? Um, that is a good question. Does anybody know what is the standard for this measure for that? Michelle, do you have thoughts? Hey, I, I don't. I just, when I saw that, I, I wondered if there was any need to sort of differentiate um, between families based on the number of children we might be talking about. That's a good question. Does anybody know the answer to that in the group? Hey, it's Becky. Haley, not to call you out, I'm wondering if we can look back at the original source of, um, the, I just know this is a national measure, and um, I don't recall there being differentiation based on number of kids. That's helpful, thank you. Or maybe size of family or something, maybe there's a way to, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was like kind of the general idea of it is that, not that I'm not saying I endorse this mindset, but it's like, how much of your income should you be paying uh -huh. on childcare? Like how much should that be consuming your overall income? Absolutely. And so this 10% marker is, is set by, I'll, I'll have to just go kind of look at our ECAP data sources to find where we aligned this to. But it's, it is a, a recognized statistic. I think your point's very well taken though, about, you know, if you have five kids, you're <laughs> going to be paying a lot on, of of funds on child care. Yeah, we will look into that, Michelle. Thank you for raising that question. And Becky, I think the ECAP, the source for the ECAP measure on this one is Child Care uh, Aware America. Um, so we can also look and see how they define their indicator. Um, this is a slightly <laughs> worded measure for the ECAP. I think you guys are the target is that you're looking for the decrease in income spent per child. Um, so I think we could probably use the same data for either of those, whatever we work on. All right, let's move forward with talking just a little bit more about um, these measures. We're obviously not gonna have to be able to have a full conversation about this today, but we do wanna get the ball rolling so that we can think about how we might create a plan for these going forward. So the question is, is based on your current knowledge, um, what are the opportunities and barriers with these two, two measures in particular? And I know that they're on the other screen, so maybe Samara, if you don't mind just copying them in the chat, if people just wanna be reminded of what they are. Um, and Bef just to get your juices flowing, here are some things that we've already heard about these measures. Um, we've heard that we might be able to use census data to estimate subsidy eligibility um, by race. So that might be one source of data. And I'm not sure, um, one question might be if, is if, our, if we're already doing that or if anybody's already doing that. Somebody had mentioned that Child Trends is working with Think, Think Babies to do this using population poverty data to develop some kind of proxy. Um, Child Care Aware America is a data source for the ECAP measures, so there might be work that they're doing. Um, we know that subsidy eligibility is based on income and employment already. Um, so we might want to think about kind of what ranges of income that we're looking for if we wanted to segregate that. Um, 
we have heard from DC DEE and other folks just about some of the challenges with capturing data on race, ethnicity, things like um, kind of how it's being reported correctly or incorrectly, or, or folks not wanting to disclose. Um, and so that is a question or a barrier that has come up. And I know that folks who aren't working in childcare in a whole other sector um, has maybe had to think about this question too. So would love to hear from you on what maybe some best practices are there. We also heard from Ariel Ford that the legacy computer system that DCDE is using maybe doesn't do the best at disaggregating race ethnicity data. So that's some feedback that we've collected so far on these. And I want to just open the floor to you all to just add to these um, opportunities and barriers with the measures that are currently, I think, copied into the chat if you'd like to see them again. So um, what are your thoughts here? And we'll just, we'll just take some notes. I wonder if there's some folks from DCDEE um, or other groups that have already worked on collecting similar measures or childcare measures that know what, why we don't have this now that can chime in. Um, hi, uh, if I can jump in just a, um, one thought is that uh, census data are fabulous for uh, calculating um, indices based on poverty measures, but it's very difficult to get contemporaneous measures. So there's going to be some time lag, and that may be a challenge mm -hmm. to, and for estimating eligibility in the current year. Thanks, Clara. Sure. Any other thoughts? Do folks know of anybody that is currently using the census data to collect this child care subsidy data by race? Or the work that Child Trends is doing? Dale couldn't be with us today. She's also on maternity leave, so we can ask her. Okay. Well, if I don't, I don't think there's anything else in the chat, and it may just be that folks need to do a little bit more thinking about this. Um, I have one other question here is, so if these are the two measures that we've agreed to work on, um, we're going to want to um, do a little bit of work outside of this meeting to help maybe answer some of these questions, do a little investigating. Maybe that would be a good next step. I know that's what we did with the previous indicators. Um, and I'm wondering who needs to be involved in that group. Is there anybody who's on the call today who would like to be a part of that discussion? We will maybe have one call over the summer, one or two calls or emails over the summer to maybe do some planning and come back to the group in September with what we've learned. Um, if you're on the call today and would love to be a part of kind of that that's very small work group um, maybe you can just let us know or put it in the chat the other question would be if they're not you're not on the call but there are people that you think should be a part of this work um, can you let us know and i will know to reach out to them any thoughts on who would be a good person or important person to have um, thinking about how we might move forward with this measure and they may or may not be people on this council. Thanks, Rich. I see your um, feedback on engaging folks from CCRNR. All right. Well, I don't see anybody who's on the call today. Um, uh, 
jumping in to be a part of this particular group, but we will need people other than me because I'm not the expert here. Um, maybe the best thing to do is that I will send out an email uh, following this email to the larger group and also do a little bit of um, asking around to see who might be able to be involved. I would ask, I mean, Becky or anybody else from DCDE, DHHS, who would be the best contact at DCDEE for this? I'm not sure if Rachel is on the call today. Could somebody give me a contact person there at least as a starting place? Okay. All right, I will do some investigating via email. And thank you, Vicki, for joining that working group. I appreciate that. Um, and Mary, we, we can take back on our side who the right contact is within the division. I also just wanted to address a comment that I saw Rich included in the chat, which I think is a good one. Um, in the past, we did have a couple of conversations with CCRNR to see if we could get more detailed um, income data specifically from them. So that may be something we want to kind of reignite a conversation around um, because we did start some discussions around that before um, COVID-19 hit. Thank you, Haley. Yeah, if you can just let me know who you think works best at the division, that would be great. And I'll make a note of that. Is there anybody um, that you all know as being kind of experts at looking at race ethnicity data in particular related to some of the barriers that we've heard around capturing data like reporting or um, just like not wanting to disclose kind of those kind of issues if that's a barrier. Okay. Well, we'll do some exploring after this call. And um, thank you, Clara, also for Carolina Demography. And Amy, I will be reaching out to you. Oh, you might be helpful there. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next item in our agenda. If folks are okay with that, feel free to put in a, a note in the chat if something comes to you later. So the other area that we had mentioned as a group being interested in was thinking about what the state of children, child serving agencies and data collection in early childhood in North Carolina has looked like during COVID-19. Um, the group had kind of talked about and potentially being interested in kind of compiling data from different state agencies through all of your resources. Um, about what has happened, what we collected, new things that we might have collected, data that might have um, been difficult to collect, and maybe creating some kind of informal report that we could either use internally as a group or potentially even use as some form of publication. Um, there was lots of thoughts on whether uh, what we might be able to do. Um, and this was a little while ago and things have obviously changed. And so the question today um, is, is this something that the council wants to move forward on doing in some way? And we were having a conversation about this with the smaller planning committee. And it was kind of raised that there might also already be some work that's um, happening around this related to the North Carolina Early Childhood Action Plan, um, kind of thinking about revising those measures, targets, and sub-targets in light of COVID. Um, and that maybe there would be some potential alignment there um, with the council and that work, and maybe we could contribute to it rather than duplicate our efforts, which I think is always makes sense. And in kind of talking um, with DHHS about that, we learned about some work um, that is that was done by UNC School of Social Work last year, um, looking at some of the data implications um, of COVID on the ECAP measures. And 
What we thought might be good today was to have Dr. Paul Lanier, one of our council members, share a little bit more about with you about the, a report that they created on the data considerations for the North Carolina Early Childhood Action Plan in response to COVID. So I'm going to ask Paul to share with us and I'll pull up his slide. And just as you're listening to Paul, maybe you can think about um, is there something that the Data Advisory Council could use from this work, a build on, um, that might kind of meet what some of our interest was um, that I shared earlier? Um, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that afterwards. So, Paul, I'll let you take it from here. Sounds great. Thank you, Mary. Um, hi, everybody. Great to see you all, our um, Data Affinity Group here. It's fun to be back with you. My name is Paul Lanier. For folks who I've not met, I'm at the UNC School of Social Work. Hi, Vicki, one of our proud alums. Um, I'm going to talk pretty briefly about a report that we wrote uh, last year, which may be embarrassingly outdated, but may still have some uh, relevance um, because, wow, I mean, just reflecting on this where we were in July, August, September of last year versus where we are now and trying to think about, um, you know, COVID-19 effect on everything um, and even in a small way on data it's um, you know, things have changed a lot but so last year kind of following up on some of the work that we did um, related to the pdg grant around data systems in early childhood um, we had conversations with um, i think becky and haley and mandy etc and said you know um, we have some capacity over the summer to start thinking about since it's fresh in our minds what some of the implications may be as far as we can tell right now um, of COVID on the data that is being used in the ECAP for the um, year 2025 targets. So um, an amazing doctoral student, uh, Caroline Chandler and I took this on. Again, I think we, I'll, I'll provide the link, all the, there's um, a full report and some, some briefs on our website. Um, and so, yeah, you wanna go to the next one, Mary, let's see. Okay, so the, the general idea was to try to think about which ECAP indicators um, represent policies and programs most vulnerable to COVID-19. I mean, they all are in some way, but um, which, which ones may be priority areas to think about? And then which of the indicators may be most concerning regarding data quality? And for quality, I'm, I'm thinking of reliability and, and validity. So um, if we're thinking, and again, this is a perfect kind of segue from the previous conversation, we want to start tracking some of these things kind of through the before COVID and then the after period. What should we be concerned about or thinking about um, if we're looking at a data point that was collected, we'll say in July of last, of last summer, um, is there a chance that that data is completely incorrect or invalid or is there some um, issues with the accuracy or just unreliable reporting of data? So uh, this was, uh, again, lots of, I think, it's, I think it's good work. I think you should take a look at it. Um, there's definitely room um, to in, improve on this, and we didn't get a whole lot of input, so we were just kind of drawing from sources we could find, you know, available online, et cetera, and just kind of our best guesses on stuff. So this is not the authoritative source on, on anything, so I just want to give that big, big caveat. All right, so next one. Um, oh, yeah, so I'm not going to go through all 10 goal areas. Again, I'll give you the links to do that. I'm just going to give a couple examples and maybe help you um, it should be pretty, I think it's pretty straightforward, but maybe how to, how to read um, the report um, in these two uh, indicators of the data indicators, if you will. So the quality, we kind of did a low, moderate, and high, maybe red, yellow, and green. Green, kind of like go for it. If, if this data was collected during the kind of pandemic period, it should still be okay. Um, and down to red, like this is, you, you really should question yourself if you are using these data because it's it could be very problematic to draw any sort of uh, inferences or insights from these data because they're the, just that it's just that troublesome um, and then the vulnerability index that we just kind of created um, red yellow and green again this doesn't seem like an area that would be highly affected by COVID. of course as we're again this is kind of hindsight now everything has obviously been upended by the pandemic versus something that's higher that's like, this is again, we may wanna completely rethink that 25, 2025 target. Uh, maybe 
there's just, it does not seem possible to reach this goal uh, given COVID. All right, next one. So I think this is just a, an example. So we took, um, as a reminder, goal two, preventive health services. And this is kind of what's written in the ECAP, what the commitment is, and then some of these goal two indicators around well child visits, families losing uh, health insurance, teledentistry, immunization. So we kind of looked for things that were indicators in the ECAP and kind of said, well, this is what we see maybe going on right now. Again, we're probably in a totally different place now in a lot of these. Next slide. And then so for each of the goal indicator areas, you can look um, in the chart and kind of see whether it's kind of green or red, um, et cetera. Um, so for example, well child visits, again, maybe the data is okay. If these are coming from healthcare uh, claims, we're assuming <clears throat> you know, that claims are still being made on Medicaid or NC Health Choice or Blue Cross Blue Shield, whoever it is. Um, however, there's probably moderate vulnerability on well child visits as people were delaying care, um, you know, social distancing, et, et cetera. Maybe it's different now, but so again, just some things to think about if you're using that data point around well child visits. Uh, next one. I think, yeah, okay, so here comes some things. We're going to track well child visits closely, maybe adjust the ECAP target. So, you know, some sample recommendations. Next one. Um, yep, okay. So, next slide. And so, um, <clears throat> and talking to Mary, so this was. Um, you can go back with this again and prefacing our conversation on percent of family income spent on child care. So again, so data quality considerations, um, you know, we were kind of talking about this before data may not accurately reflect changes in spending or changes in family income. Um, and again, as we're thinking about things like um, you know, the American Rescue Plan or you know, checks going out to families, how all those things are um, you know, counted as income or not, lots of people lost employment, obviously. So if you're thinking of percent of income, if you were making 50,000 a year, 10% of that is a number, but if now you're making $0, it just changes the entire landscape of the distribution of what people's income was during this period of time and probably will for, for a while. And there's, you know, supplemental uh, income or, or um, you know, money that have been coming to families uh, through other sources. So it's just, again, obviously pretty, pretty obvious, just a different dynamic. So, um, and then again, this is a little, then the vulnerability, this may be a little bit outdated, but again, if, if at that point we weren't sure if people were going to be sitting, going back to schools or not physically, so, um, et cetera. Okay, I think that was it. Was that it? Oh, yeah. Okay, so conclusion. Um, these were kind of the things, and you know, so we went through all of the ECAP indicators. Um, we looked at um, maybe some things that were priorities. And so the federal poverty level, um, again, related to the economic downturn, et cetera, you see that kind of across several goal areas. So, you know, again, something that should probably be, you know, continue to be monitored. And, you know, some issues with census data probably, but overall we should have pretty good consistent data on, um, you know, percent below federal poverty level, et cetera. And then, so as you can see, just a few other kind of uh, ECAP goal areas that we thought would be uh, high priorities because the data seems to be pretty good quality, would be decent quality, um, but probably areas that would be highly vulnerable to the effects of COVID, at least as we were thinking about it last July and August. Thank you, Paul. I think that's your last slide. I think uh, it was, yep. And I'm wondering what questions folks have for Paul, just getting a quick overview of this. Um, we did link the report in the chat. Does anybody have any questions about this work? I know KC has shared in the comments that at DPI they have found um, Significant impacts on COVID remote learning has been for economically disadvantaged and disciplined data down to pre-K. Um, mm. Yeah, this is Casey. I can speak to that a bit. Um, and I think it's pretty, you know, I think Paul said it well. <laughs> he said that there's very few data areas that haven't been impacted. 
Um, but when kids are learning remotely, you know, no one's writing them up for being missing from the dining room, right? So there's very, very significant impacts um, in the discipline data, and especially considering that that was one of the um, data points that early childhood was looking at, you know, and may, because of, I think it came up because of ASA, I'm concerned. I haven't seen um, the data myself down, except what we sent to the feds, which doesn't include um, early childhood years. Um, but I would expect the impacts there to be pretty significant. And then of course, getting the information additional information from the parents on economically disadvantaged is missing because there's no one, there's no paperwork going home. There's no one in the office to work on the paperwork. We do get the SNAP and um, information from DHHS. So we do have that. We have the vast majority of it. But what we are missing would be any children that filled out applications or are categorically eligible. Um, which includes some of our most disenfranchised populations. So it's like a catch-22. So anyway, just wanted to give a little clarity to that, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. That's helpful. Anything else that other folks want to share, maybe with things that they've seen in the data that they've been working at? Obviously, all of the data has been impacted, as everyone has said. I'm wondering um, if Becky has anything to share just about how you've used this report or thinking about using this with the ECAP measures moving forward. Mary, I think uh, Becky may have had to drop. I don't see her on the call anymore, but okay. I, I know just from some of our conversations um, that it, this is being used as a tool to think about sort of the strategy going forward with the Early Childhood Action Plan, but also a little bit more broadly about the department's work um, and sort of the longer term things that we need to address related to early childhood as we kind of move from one phase of the pandemic to the other in particular. Thank you, Haley. Yeah, I think to me, I was just going to add, Mary, uh, you know, I think one hope that we had, again, is, as we all know, like with the, with the data and a, a nice comprehensive plan like ECAP, we still, um, you know, the, a lot of these systems and data systems exist in silos. And so you are most likely, you know, within, you know, health or early childhood or CPS or whatever, already having these conversations, but may not be aware, you know, if I grab an indicator from another, you know, sector or something, what some of the issues are. So, I think it's, again, hopefully it's a helpful um, you know, resource to be able to continue updating a document like this so you kind of are other people who are using data points from other sectors kind of know some of the caveats or issues or why we don't use this anymore, why we're not using it for the entire year of 2020, but now we're using it again, what, whatever the thing is. So um, if there's a process to try to continue to um, you know, collect that information, you know, I'm happy to, happy to do that and try to compile if people have edits, you know, to your specific area and say you're totally missed the mark here. I, I'm personally happy if you want to just email and then we can you know, think about a process to refining the document either together or, you know, for now, um, we, can, we can do that on our end. I think that's a great idea. Paul. Yeah, I think, um, hi everyone. Yeah, this is Amy Hon Nelson. I apologize, I have a sick kid. I'm en route to a doctor, um, ironically enough, since we've Talking about well visits. Um, I, I think Paul's point is really, really important. And because so much of early childhood data is dependent on data sources that go beyond just, you know, <laughs> early childhood measures. Um, I'll say in our world of integrated data, we're very concerned about this. Um, there was even a national report that came out yesterday from Data Quality Campaign. I'm not sure if they'll sell that, but um, it had it has me very worried about people using metrics in ways that are problematic, um, you know, after 16 months into this pandemic. Um, and I do think that there's a role for groups like this to give some guidance or um, go in some ways beyond early childhood. Like I'd be really interested in seeing some kind of document like this that's specific for K-12 education um, and maybe even post-secondary education. I mean, it's, there are just so many considerations 
um, that folks, especially folks who haven't been in a school building or, you know, front row seat to the disruptions and the challenges, um, just to put a lot of caveats around data. Um, I'll also say I am very worried about use of data longitudinally in the future. Um, we saw that a lot for those of us who've been around for a while, like in 2007, when there was like renorming of VOGs and then someone does an analysis, you know, 10 years later, and there's that same data without the renorming um, <laughs> detailed. You know, I, I'm very worried about things like that. Um, and not sure the best way to do that, except for some clear guidance of like these data should never be used longitudinally, um, except for with these very careful um, caveats around it. So any thoughts anyone has? Sorry for the um, meandering comments. No, all really important and useful comments, Amy. Thank you. Um, do you know, it sounds like you don't know of folks that are necessarily thinking about that guidance for the longitudinal data. You just know that it's important and people are talking about it. Yeah, I mean, we are definitely trying to get conversations going. Um, and so our network, we support integrated data systems across the US. And so like, I'm trying to plan some conversations um, just to go across the silos because our work is all cross sector. And so exactly Paul's comment of like, if you're within sector, there's some really obvious ones. Um, but if you're out of sector or you're at a high level and don't understand what it looked like on the ground, um, mm -hmm. I just think, like I'll give a simple example. Um, I've seen some folks use some national, like state level data to look at, you know, teacher attendance. Mm -hmm. um, like, what does that even mean? Like my kid's teacher um, was out for two 10 day mandatory, you know, like at home <laughs> because she was exposed to COVID, she never had COVID. But like, if people don't understand that that data is not helpful, um, because they weren't on the ground or didn't really see how it played out in the school building. Um, there's got to be someone to kind of like, you know, be the lower acts and speak for the for the school building on some of these data. And I, I worry that that's not happening. I think you we have lost you, Amy, or at least I have lost you. Um, I hope that we can I'm, hear I'm sorry. the last part yeah, of it. Yeah. Okay. And you know, just that there's got to be someone to contextualize the on the ground experience of how these data are collected and what's really happening. Amy, would you be able to, if I couldn't find it on my own, share the report that you mentioned on the, from the data quality campaign that just came out? Yeah, if anyone gets it, it, was, it came out yesterday. Um, it was on okay. their newsletter, but, but it was around SLDSs and kind of what's on a, on a data, on a school report card and what's not. And they, and I agree with their premise that like there are things on school report cards that probably shouldn't be there. I did not agree with some of their other conclusions, but um, it more just proves the point of like, there's worrisome work being done with data of people that don't really understand how different the experience was state by state, county by county um, because of different, you know, COVID policies. Right. So it more just tells the bigger picture of like, we are really in, um, we, we have some challenges ahead of us for folks like us who are trying to look cross sector at a large geography um, with researchers that may not be fully connected on the ground. Yeah. Thank you, Amy, for that perspective. It's really important. And Paul, for sharing about this work today, it is really important. And I do think this is a really great resource, as you said, for especially for folks to understand what the data implications are in other areas than the ones that they're currently working on. Any other final questions for, for Paul? Um, Just I, one for brief comment. Um, Paul, I, I think, well, actually it's sort of reflecting on what both you and Amy said, but I. I do wonder if it would be helpful as a next step to get some more information from these different sectors about what they've observed are the data challenges, which could include data quality um, issues. Because, and, and they may have seen things from working in particular with like local partners um, on data collection throughout the pandemic that could be helpful and inform um, you know, maybe expanding what what Paul's team has already put together, um, but also could help us think about the strategy going forward. 
Um, this is Jackie Keener. I joined late. I'm sorry, I had trouble getting in and I'm joined by phone. Um, I would kind of echo what Haley's saying. I think, I mean, I've worked in different kind of data for over 30 years. And I think that one of the things that happens are that there are data quality issues. There are also issues like you're talking about, you know, understanding it on the ground, boots on the ground where it's being collected. Um, and I think, you know, the SLDS, you know, we're developing or have one in North Carolina and we're looking to modernize it. That kind of information I think is very important. And, you know, our group has often talked about <clears throat> putting out reference information and other information for researchers that may ac access the data. Um, and, and also LEAD, um, which is the Labor Market Information Division who has the common follow-up system, one of their practices um, they publish, um, you know, information about outcomes on workforce programs and training programs. But one of their practices is always when they do some research to bring in the subject matter experts to review it with them before they publish. So I think there's a lot that can be put in place to help alleviate some of that where people are misinterpreting data. Mm. Thank you, Jackie. And welcome to the call. Sorry you had trouble getting in. Uh, oh, no worries. This is um, a really big topic and certainly not one we're going to answer today. I guess the question I have for you all just before we take a short break before our guest speaker is this question you see here. Do you think it's a good step for our council and maybe I'll change that word to, sit, to report on to be to look further into how we might um, look at North, North Carolina's early childhood data during COVID, potentially building off this work with the ECAP measures. Um, I guess the question is, do you think it's worth us continuing to explore how we can work together as a council to maybe do some of these things we've mentioned, like, um, you know, seeing what each, the challenges that each, exploring more from the sectors about what the challenges have been or what they've done or what guidance might look like um, or do you feel like this is kind of beyond our capacity um, and we should just say no from the get-go? I'm going to just put up a quick poll, Sumira, if you don't mind, to again just get your, your thoughts on this um, and just think of it as a question, maybe not do you agree, but like do you want to consider continue having a conversation and exploring how we can be involved in this? Looks like we have some good work to build off of with Paul's work. All right, I think we have 100% of the votes in. And if you can see them now, 93% of you said yes, let's keep exploring this and potentially doing um, some further work in this area with one person saying no. So we will do that. Um, and we might uh, reach out to some of you to continue exploring what that might work might look like. And in the meantime, please do send Paul um, any feedback you have on um, on their report and maybe some additions that could be made if you have that. We have time for a five minute um, body break um, before we hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Ioma Aruka who will be joining us and starting her presentation exactly at 1230. So if you don't mind being back at your laptop um, or your computer, um, maybe a minute or two before 1230, we'll just go ahead and take a break. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hope you enjoyed your break. We have the privilege of having Dr. Ioma Aruka joining us today for um, a presentation of her work. As I mentioned earlier, some of the objectives of the Early Childhood Data Advisory Council are to um, facilitate data sharing and building partnerships and relationships and learning from other uh, groups that are doing important data work. And um, I really feel like this is an opportunity for us to do this um, with Dr. Aruka and her, her team. Um, for those of you who don't know her, she is a research um, 
professor at the UNC Department of Public Policy and a fellow at Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute. She is a co-founder of the Riser Network and also um, the founding director of the Equity Research Action Coalition. Um, and we are so pleased to have you with us here today, Dr. Aruka. We've shared a, a little bit more information about you in the chat and we hope folks um, will get to know you and your work. I have your slides ready to go and you can um, sh you can get started whenever you're ready. Awesome, thank you, Mary. Um, and obviously thank you to the whole group. And obviously I'll only be here for, you know, give you a short, like a really short uh, sort of a segment of this report. And um, I just wanna thank you for allowing me to enter your space. And so what I'm gonna just share with you is actually a report that um, I and, and others released really regarding how black parents um, were dealing with both the two pandemics of COVID-19 and racism. And it really came out because what happened is Somebody asked me a question. I was like, I don't know. I thought this group was going to do it. And then it ended up that, that I said, let's, let's go ahead and do it and really create this report that I think really is trying to show what Black families with young children are dealing with. Um, next slide, please. And so just to, to let you know, so obviously, I'm part of UNC Chapel Hill, and um, I am the founder director of the Equity Research Action Coalition, which really is sort of a, a group that's really focusing on how do we engage with the communities to align our research practice and policy to with a strength-based uh, uh, equity-centered lens to it. And so we work with a diversity of, of groups from researchers like myself to also community-based organizations. Again, really focusing a lot on Black children and families in particular, but also in coalition with other groups focusing on Latino children, uh, uh, tribal communities, et cetera. And then Riser Network is actually uh, it's a, it's a network, a mentoring network, really, um, that was started between me and another colleague at Boston University who's um, at the seed, the Center on the Ecology of Early Development. And the idea is that we wanted to make sure that we had a place where, where we can both mentor multi-generationally, but also be able to push out, you know, related information about Black children and families and educators um, across the country. So it really is, is a network of, of scholars, of, of academics in many ways, and also practitioners and some policymakers and funders. Next slide, please. So really just to, to make sure that that I think to crystallize why we thought the report was really important is that really then the end of it, we're trying to at least attend to what are the things that we believe children need in the first few years of life. And for those of you on the call, and I know all of you, you know, not I don't know all of you, but I know you must understand obviously the importance and impact uh, of sort of these structural determinants and social determinants of, of, of health, which I took and sort of reframed as really the structural determinants of early learning, that we're trying to meet the needs of children, particularly children who have been historically marginalized, then we have to attend to some of these social determinants, um, whether it's things like, you know, transportation, food, housing, water, you know, and then have policies that make sure that the condition for children and families to thrive and be healthy and, and be ready for school and success and succeed in life, we have to create those conditions. So, of course, we know that there's a lot of good things happening, especially in terms of from Department of Health and Human Services around sort of the, the I think is the healthy opportunities where we're going to have to think about how do you you begin to assess these things as part of early childhood. Next slide, please. And so just to kind of tell you the data for the for the report, it really came out of the rapid EC with Phil Fisher and his team at the University of Oregon. And really, you know, it's, it's a data that a lot of us, you know, across the country have been using and we're so glad that, that Phil and team have pulled it together. And really it's an ongoing survey of households with young children, uh, birth to age five. And it's really to gather really just essential information about how children and families are doing in terms of health, um, economic resources, stability, material hardships, um, as well as early care education options. And then where the RISER network actually came in is that we were approached to sort of really help support their con how they think about issues around race and discrimination, but really make sure that, that it's, it's getting at some of these equity sort of issues that tend to not be in many national surveys. And so we actually added in the race and discrimination as well as the parent-child socialization pieces to the rapid national data. And so I'll be sharing just a, a small segment of that but obviously there's a website for rapid ec for those who may not be familiar with it next slide please and so the rapid so for this particular report we just focus on black families um and where and in the report where we were possible we actually uh, gave you at least not a comparison but at least told you here's the rest of the sample and what they look like and so this sample for rapid was about almost 800 families who were surveyed really in, uh last year obviously as soon as the pandemic started at least here in the, in the, in the u.s in april and through november um obviously we're still actually still analyzing data so we have new reports that'll be coming out soon 
Um, but the average household income here was about almost $70,000, which is actually quite high. So we are working with Phil and team to kind of actually get a, a, a more um, representative stamp economic spectrum, particularly for black families, because this higher income uh, families, if they're having this level of stressors, then what does it mean for the, the, uh, to, for the typical uh, black family um, across the country? And about 8% of the families were immigrant speakers and the majority were English speakers. Um, and you can see where a lot of the families came from, obviously from California, Texas, North Carolina, and, and parts of the Northeast, and a little bit of the, um, more of the, the central. Midwest. Why don't you go back one, please? And so for the racism discrimination, it was actually added later on um, in the battery, but it's this is about 200 families, just to give you a sense of just what, at least 200 out of that sort of uh, almost 800 families. And so to me, we always think this is an important one to share about how families are experiencing racism and discrimination. And so we actually asked specific questions about the experiences prior to and since the pandemic. And, um, and also their frequency of concern for their children prior to and since the pandemic. Um, think, and some of the examples you see there is getting stopped in a white neighborhood or being punished more harshly than others. Again, this is parents reporting of, of that. Uh, next slide. And so just based on the data and, and the black marks is kind of where the average, most of the, all the parents from the rapid uh, EC survey. So you can kind of compare it to see in essence, you can see that black families are reporting just much more elevated both obviously mostly in the pre-pandemic, but then during the pandemic, you can see it kind of stabilized a little lower, but it's still high compared to everybody else. But again, you see sort of the high number of being called a slur um, and obviously things like not being hired and discouraged from education. So you can see the report, but you can see that black parents are reporting a high experience of discrimination pre-pandemic. But of course, because you're at home and not having to be exposed to sadly society in that great uh, amount, they have a reduced amount, a, a reduced number. But you can see that the, the levels for being called a slur was still high, relatively higher, almost 30% compared to um, uh, other people as well, compared to other groups. Next slide, please. And then in terms of black parents' concern for their children, I think this is where it's important for people to understand that, you know, that, that parents, when you're experiencing something, you obviously fear that, that your children are going to have some, some potential experiences as well. And so we asked parents, what were their concerns for their children? And again, you can see here that, you know, there's a, you know, no matter your race or, or your ethnicity, you can see that parents were, were still concerned at least about exclusion uh, practices. They were also concerned about care and education. And for this group, this is important, right? That, that for even during the pandemic, all parents were really concerned about you know the care education for their children but again beyond those uh, the, those specific indicators you can see that black parents with young children were still very much worried about their child's life choices their child's experience in harsh punishment mistreatment etc so again it tells you that where there are some similarities in terms of black parents and other parents that there were many areas where black parents are highly rated that they were really concerned about their children's life experiences um, over time. And this is something that I think is important for, for you all to consider as you think about your priority data. Next slide, please. And so a part of this report was to, to bring the voices, right? So it's one thing to kind of just run data and run numbers, but another thing is to kind of really hear what the parents are saying. So I'll just read one of these. But obviously, if you have access to the report, I think they dropped a link in there, or you might have gotten it, you can read the report and you can see that the voice of the parents coming through. So I'll just read one of them, um, which is the one in the blue that just says, you know, racism, the historical and contemporary trauma and grief that is occurring is overwhelming. Add that on top of a pandemic when I cannot use my regular outlets to center myself, the gym, hang out with friends, etc. It is exhausting. Um, so again, the reason we put this one first is because racism and experience of discrimination are not the things that people naturally collect, but we know that it has such um, pernicious effect on, on families' daily experiences and eventually children's daily experiences. So it's something for you to consider. Um, next slide, please. And so this gets into sort of the family security that we saw in terms of Black families. And we saw that Black families, again, remember that they're about 20,000 above the median for Black families across the country. And so Black families were experiencing high levels of economic instability, uh, again, regardless of their household income level. So we did do middle income versus lower income families, um, with half of all Black families reporting a decrease in income during the pandemic. Um, and so, of, of course, attending to, to addressing those losses of income is important. And over 40% of Black families who are below or near poverty uh, were really experiencing a financial strain even after receiving the stimulus check. So this is the CARES Act 
uh, we asked about how did they feel. So even after getting those checks, they still felt a really high level of financial strain. Uh, next slide, please. And then specifically to material hardship, um, you know, again, obviously, if you're economically stressed in terms of being below or near poverty, we see the numbers where almost 50% of Black families had difficulty paying for utilities. Um, we had obviously almost over a third to having issues with housing, and food, um, and not as, as big, obviously, for early care education. Again, I would think it's because a lot of people were not actually going back anyway, so that was not their concern at that time. Um, but but we, we see that over a third, almost a third of families who are below and near poverty reported at least three or more material hardships. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, about 50% were receiving public benefits, and then at least 67% uh, were receiving access to free food. But again, just to highlight the middle income that, yes, compared to those who are below near poverty, it was not as dire. But to still see that the middle income families were still really about a quarter were still having issues around, you know, being able to pay for utilities, housing, and food. Again, when we think about the social determinants of, of learning and health, we recognize that if families are not able to access this, that this has a, a detrimental impact on children's development and cognitive, cognitive development, et cetera. All right, next slide. Um, and of course, you know, parental health care was another aspect of RAPID that, that we tried to attend to and really trying to understand why the families, you know, delay health care of any kind. And again, of course, the uh, concern for COVID. And so obviously we'll look at these numbers as, as the numbers come down as, as, as more uh, restrictions are lifted. Um, but again, we also did see that the inability to find early care education was really up there regardless of your income. It was much more uh, higher for families who were below or near poverty, but it was still a big concern of being able to find care was really the reason for delaying your health care. Of course, uh, a work being an issue for a lot of our families reported, obviously being a central workforce. So being able to find time was a, was a concern. And, of, and then also caring for, for family members was another issue that caused the delay in health care. Um, and so again, the, the voices just, I think, emphasize that the families, particularly Black families, had the paranoia of, of getting sick and ultimately dying, right? And also racism and, and the fact So again, we're trying to, to have people understand that in with issues of racism and discrimination for Black families, that was pretty much a really toxic uh, combination that's still with us uh, till today. And so you can see the voices from the parents that talk about just, you know, the feeling of you just can't breathe and trying to find an outlet. Next slide, please. And this is, I know it just looks messy and noisy, but um, really, this is really about, the data is really showing you sort of just how the parents feel in terms of their anxiety, which is kind of that light blue version, or the, the depression, that more darker version. But you can see how, um, as, as the, the pandemic, the pre-pandemic is on the left-hand side, and obviously uh, in, in, through like November, the latter part, you can see how it just kept on sort of the, the, the stressors, loneliness kind of kept on inching up, the anxiety and depression. So, so again, this is Black family saying that, you know, we are challenged and, and being locked down, locked in, not having all those outlets, that it clearly, they were feeling the stress of it uh, themselves. Uh, next, please. And so, you know, uh, while, and, and they don't, the kids, and so the parents were also asked about sort of their children. Um, and so almost a third of Black parents reported that their child missed a checkup during the pandemic. Um, but I would say that when we look deeper into the data, they didn't miss when there needs to be some sort of uh, um, vaccination, but it was really just if it was just a well checkup. Um, and of course, it's because of exposure to the virus. Again, that was most people's also reasoning. Um, regardless of race, actually. Um, and so you can just see that parents will also ask how they felt their child was feeling, whether they were more fussy or def defiant or more, tear uh, more fearful or anxious. And again, you can see that in terms of, of the bars that, right, families reported less in terms of internalizing problems and their children were, were, were exhibiting more externalizing problems. But, it, it, you know, it's, it's generally flat, but you can see it increase over time. Again, you know, the stressors of families seems to mimic the stressors of the children um, in many ways. So again, it's something that we need to attend to in terms of how do we collect data to both the, the viewpoint from how parents are feeling and also how that then manifests potentially in the household and how children exhibit those experiences and those stressors. Next slide, please. And then just, you know, and, and I didn't put the data around the early care education options here, but I would just say that that I think typical with what we see with other national data is that in essence, you know, once the pandemic started, parents just literally did not use a lot of center-based care, but we just see them use both unpaid and paid more home-based 
or family friend neighbor sort of care. And that is pretty much staying sort of consistent in the data that we've seen recently. So, so there is some return back to center, but there's still sort of this, I think, movement of families either remaining in family friend neighbor care and potentially home-based care. So that may be something to really think about, about where are the children um, and where are they the whole time the parents are working. So, so just some high level key findings for you is, is you know, you know, in the end of it, you know, black children and their families are experiencing racism and discrimination across contexts. We don't measure this, we don't assess this, and this is something that we have to attend to uh, because I believe it is one of the ACEs that we have never actually ever measured. And it's something that we have to continue to do. And it's good to see NIH actually ask for that kind of call to say, how do we determine and measure really critically structural racism and not the output, not the output like you know, housing and, and educational access, but what does it look like? Um, and we know that black families are experiencing high levels of economic instability, regardless really of household income level. So again, is this idea that you may be higher income by number, but there are clearly a lot of stressors economically that you're still dealing with. And remember that this, this sample is higher income than usual, right? The median for black families is about 45,000. And this one's about 65,000. So this is a higher income and they're still experiencing high levels of, of economic instability as well as material hardships. And again, parents were delaying their healthcare visits and their children did miss well baby visits. But I think for the most part, we can see that uh, catch up happening in terms of as soon as uh, the vaccine was, was coming and, and the numbers went down. Um, and of course, as I said, you know, black families are reporting material hardships, including difficulty paying for just basic needs like, you know, uh, utilities, uh, and food and housing really important for, for the stability and the well-being of children, especially in the first five years of life. And of course, parents reported experiencing anxiety, depression, stress, and loneliness. And, and obviously we saw that inch higher over time. And we also saw their children's both externalizing uh, problems that they reported as well as the internalizing problems that they reported it. So, so we do see that it's having a whole family effect. Um, and this was, see, and it actually looked higher compared to other groups of families. And then I think I have one more slide, Ramari. And so just, I think for you all, as you think about sort of this sort of report and how it could, you know, for you to consider is, is how do you capture some traditional and unique data, right? And, and that's why I stress the discrimination data, the racism data. And I would say, you know, there are other data points that I would suggest that, that not only shows these sort of like adversities, but also the positive effects, the positive things that families are doing um, and, and how they're resilient. So being able to capture both these adversities, but also the resilience and, and, and have that shape how we support uh, families with young children and children themselves. Um, and I would say concern not only the what, but the how. So obviously I'm a researcher, I think, and I'm quantitatively leaning, but I, I think it's really important that we think about, obviously it's good to get a lot of data and numbers from, from because it's easier to capture that sort of information, but also think about, do you do focus groups? Do you do more interviews? To, do you do different ways of gathering the voices of the community, the voices of the families and educators or whoever you're serving to make sure that you really understand and unpack what the data is telling you and also you know consider the whom right i think it's, it was important that riser network you know as a, really a, a, a network that's really centered on black children families and educators that we were part of of, of of creating the knowledge and being able to identify areas of gap in the rapid data that was not there before so, so i think it's important to not just think about the what or the how but also the whom and who are you collaborating with um, and again, as I said, capture the family voices in different ways um, and, and really and really institute that in an authentic way so that that if we're trying to do, you know, if you're trying to understand what's happening with, with people that you really begin to really have those conversations. And some of these conversations are hard, but they are doable. And it's something that I'll encourage uh, you and the teams to do um, in many different ways. Um, and of course, as a, you know, the, the Equity Research Action Coalition is really not focused on just research, but how to actually activate research in different ways, whether it's through the policy making arm of things or whether through the, the grassroots or through the community-based organizations. But it's really about how do we support action-oriented research that doesn't take five years to finish, but it really we're able to, to get data in and out and to whether it's a community member, whether it is to policymakers like yourselves or to, to organizations to really be able to activate that in a very meaningful way. Um, and of course, think about the pros and cons. And then how to leverage multiple data. Again, this was rapid data, but obviously we have the, the, the pulse data from the feds, from the census. So we have to begin to think about how do we triangulate information? And obviously being the state of North Carolina, there's a lot of data floating. So how do we begin to leverage multiple data sources? 
identify the impacts, the gaps and opportunities. Um, I was just on a call, I think, with the, with the state office did their monthly uh, connect call, the Office of State Budget Management, talking about all of the funds and how they'll be released based on the governor's, you know, obviously plan. And the question is, you know, how do we know it's having an impact? Are we going to be able to address the fact that many Black families are, are, are struggling, even those who are higher income? You know, are the funds going to be enough to, to not just get you out of poverty, but actually help you be mobile, upwardly mobile, to help address the issues of of child care needs that, that we know is still very much a significant challenge in the state. Um, and of course, I would say continue to disaggregate data and not just disaggregate it to look at it and to gap gaze at it, but to think about the root causes. And so I, again, harping back to the structural determinants of learning and health about we have to understand it's not the fault of families to be in sort of economically challenged situations, but it's also the system that creates that condition. And even for the families who were higher income, again, this was a higher income sample. So even they were still struggling with that. So we have to recognize that there are other things that we have to continue to do, um, including providing much more economic resources, but in a way that actually meets the needs of the individual group. So um, with that, I will stop talking and just thank you for letting me enter your space. And I know that was a lot, so I cram, try to cram a lot in there, so. Thank you, Dr. Ruka. And you're right, that is, um, this amount of time really does not do justice for how much we could really talk about and share with this really important work. Um, I want to leave time for questions for the group um, to, to Dr. Ruka. Feel free to unmute yourself um, or add them in the chat. No, it's a lot to take in, but we have her for a few more minutes. If you have some, yeah, this is this is Jackie Keener. Um, I have a question for you. I think the points that you made about focus groups and gathering other information and about the, um, the whom you're talking to and how are very important. In particular, since we're moving towards using more administrative data and research. So how, how would you suggest a researcher kind of build those in um, you know, to make it, if they're doing a grant proposal or whatever, so whoever the grantor is, that the, they see it as important? Yeah, that's actually a really great question. You're right. And, and I think we should, I would definitely encourage the use of administrative data and, and, and many existing data where possible, just because we, we, we have so much of, of them that are around and we don't use enough of them. So I would say that what could, what you could do is, is do, you could do either a pre, a post, a parallel. So for example, if you have a data set, just even say on childcare quality, right, you can, you can even to before you even start going into that data, is potentially do sort of a focus groups or even a, a town hall conversation with families or providers about what is childcare quality to you? How should it matter, right? So being able to, to do that sort of work uh, beforehand could be helpful in terms of how you may look at the data and how have the data lead you. And subsequently, you can also do it afterwards, right? A lot of times, we sort of do a lot of, you know, administrative data, we push it out. But the question is, what is the narrative? What is it telling you? Is there something that you're missing, right? Because you can sort of, we can, uh, you know, as, a, as an analyst, I can, I can run a whole lot and, and sort of just tell you what it says. But how do you interpret it? And the action behind it may actually require you to either engage with those who are going to be affected by whatever you found, but for those, you know, whether it's, it's the providers. So I would say in many ways, I, I would say if you can do some, some, some pre- before you jump into the data, but even, but much more especially the after, because I think the interpretation is usually what matters, particularly for policymakers or those who are going to use that information to activate X, Y, and Z. The more you can actually understand what the data is saying, right? Not saying that, that, that you don't or we don't, but it's to give the full context in the story. And a lot of times we take, that's why I say I use the danger of a single story. If we take what just that number says and we don't fully contextualize it, we could be, we could actually uh, ask for action that is not equitable, that can lead to more problems that we did not anticipate. So that will be just a couple of suggestions I, I will give to you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question in the chat from Rich. Um, it says, can you comment on how you use qualitative methods when developing surveys to make sure the language and position of the surveys um, is free of biased language? 
That's a great question, Rich. Thank you for that. So, so the be I would say the beauty of what we were at least able to do with with this, with at least our portion of the rapid data, and then I think what we're doing overall is that a lot of times, you know, we 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 we, we assume that a lot of our thing is sort of bias free, and and there's no you know presumption there. But what I think, what I would suggest is that we actually send our questionnaire. So either one is either you, when you're developing it, you actually bring a larger group together. So for example, I'm actually developing a new survey set of surveys, and I'm like asking all my community members can you just come before I, I really finish it just come let's meet together let's kind of have a conversation before even the questions are even identified it's like what's our priority area so that that may not be sort of where you're at but I think before it actually ever releases that actually have a conversation with the questions in mind right because what happens is and that's why we say pilot it right and, and most of us we pilot it but we really don't pilot it like we don't ask so now if you get this question, do you feel some kind of way about it? Are there any emotions that are listed? I think we have to kind of have these really like very, very, uh, I think open discussion about it. And I think it's also who are we asking? So being able to ask, you know, a swat of people from different racial, social backgrounds and even linguistic backgrounds, I think could help us ensure that as much as we can do bias-free language, right, in many ways. And so I think it's trying to make sure that we're piloting it, that we actually reach a diversity of people with a in a diversity of places because the way I read it, even if it's a black woman, the way I read it compared to one of my colleagues who's a black woman could be actually different. And so being able to at least be able to find your blind spots would be helpful. But knowing that there is, it's probably no perfection. There's no perfect question. You're going to, somebody's going to find something wrong with it. Even all of us who are, you know, equity, I would say, quote unquote, racial equity people, we always make mistakes. And so I think it's impossible to have perfection, but at least you can do better. And if somebody tells you this question is not, is worded in a way that's a bit offensive, then you should take that time to actually adjust it and ask that question. So I, again, I want us to be careful that we're not going to sort of say, we're going to create a perfect question instead of sur a survey questions. It's, it, it's hard, but I think it's, it's doing a due diligence as much as you can ahead of time and that's hard work and funders don't pay for that too FYI <laughs> we have time for one more quick question if you have a minute Dr. Roca is there any other yeah. questions well I will just say that what you have shared in 30 minutes um, is remarkable and um, just even having your time today to join our council meeting is um, a privilege. And um, what I was trying to do when that slide was going back and forth in the screen earlier was to enter something in the chat and I was having a problem uh, doing that and so I'm sorry for that. But as we were thinking about the takeaways for our data development, what I wanted to say more importantly is what are we hearing from the voices of these Black parents um, and their experiences that um, change the way that we're thinking. And we spent a lot of time at the beginning of this meeting talking about how we want to desegregate measures around childcare um, in North Carolina and also the COVID context. And this, um, even just your last point about thinking about not just desegregating the data, but thinking about what the root causes are of um, those disparities that we see and really looking at the interpretation and the context and the stories behind that data is really what's important. So that's just something that I wanted to add. Thank you so much. Um, did you want to say anything about the RISER network, just in case any of these folks are involved? Is there a way for them to connect? Sure. I would just briefly say thank you for that. And thank you for your comments too, Mary. Um, I would just say, you know, obviously it's a network where we're, you know, we're mentoring, we're supporting. It's a multi-generational uh, network, including one of our own at UNC, uh, Jim Johnson, you may know. And so really if, if people want to engage with the network, feel free to join right there. Um, feel free to obviously hashtag. Um, and obviously if you have, if you need um, students, postdocs, who you, who you want to kind of be part of something you're doing, we're happy to share also information um, from your organizations if you're looking to recruit both from senior, mid-career, early career, et cetera. So we're always happy to plug uh, and share. So thank you for the opportunity to share this particular report with you. Wonderful. Thank you for your important work. And I hope that all of the folks on the council, if they haven't already heard of your work and your team can continue to follow and be engaged. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Have a great one, everybody. Be safe. You too. Have a wonderful long weekend. All right. We are going to continue with um, two more updates. 
um, from first from Dan Tichow and Jenny Wilkinson, who are going to give us a really quick overview for those of you who aren't familiar with the Excellent Public Schools Act of 2021, and in particular some of their thoughts on their preparation for the data requirements for that act that are coming. Um, they will let you know that um, things are still very much in process with this work, and they are planning um, to hopefully share more at our next meeting. So um, I will let you guys take it from here. Okay. And I, I think I'm going to ask, I think Jenny's, uh, she had a hard time with the link. It wouldn't let her into the meeting, but she called in. Okay. And so, I, I, you know, if she wants to chime in, uh, she's absolutely um, welcome to, but I don't think she can see the slides. So I'm going to go ahead and just speak. Um, and and that, 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 that previous slide make, made me smile a little bit, but that page, picture is probably 10 years old. I probably need to send a portrait <laughs> picture. I, I found it online. <laughs> it so <laughs> that was back when I was I was president of NCAYC and I was I, it was like the 60th anniversary and I was actually cutting a cake at the at the <laughs> at the convention center in in, uh, <laughs> in Raleigh. Anyways, that yeah, was too much information. So, um, uh, so yeah, thank you for having us this afternoon to kind of provide, a, a, as you said, a brief update of the new uh, Excellent Public Schools Act of 2021, aka uh, Read to Achieve. Um, and what we, you know, we, we kind of uh, pulled some things out to share. We're not, I'm not going to review all of the sections of the law, but just several sections, um, some of which pertain to uh, early childhood data. Some are just we, we thought you might be interested in. Um, the, the law itself, uh, you know, its aim is to provide a comprehensive plan um, based on, you know, years of feedback from education partners and groups and to put some of those recommendations into practice. So. Um, you can go to the next slide now, thanks. So I, I, I don't want to assume that everybody has a great amount of familiarity with uh, the Excellent Public Schools Act and Read to Achieve. So kind of just a brief history lesson. It, it actually originated back in 2012 and, uh, and then was first put into, uh, into uh, or implemented, put into practice in 2000, the 2013-14 school year. And the goal was to ensure that every student is reading at or above grade level by the end of third grade. Um, it includes a lot of different components to provide various supports uh, so that children, um, you know, not only uh, uh, catch struggling readers early and provide them with the supports that they need, but also to uh, keep children progressing along that continuum uh, as they, you know, uh, learn to read and comprehend and and uh, engage with um, more complex texts. I should go to the next one. And so, um, so April 9th of this year, Governor Cooper signed into law Senate Bill 387. Um, and there are uh, eight key components of the law. Um, the first two sections just really define the overall purpose and then also the definition of the science of reading uh, so that there's a more unified definition or, 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 a, or the same definition is being used across the state, if you will. And, um, uh, and, and this law and these sections will begin to go into place in 21-22. And then there's different, uh, different dates. You'll see different states as we go through this. Um, so we, the, first, the first section that we kind of want to talk a little bit about and share with you is section three. And section three uh, implement, uh, emphasizes the implementation of some training, some professional development on the science of reading. Um, you may or may not know there was another law passed um, related to COVID funds that actually named a vendor to provide this training. Uh, it's Voyager Sopris Learning Incorporated. And uh, they provide uh, training, uh, the acronym is LETTERS. And, um, and so uh, this training will be provided to uh, pre-K through fifth grade teachers as well as coaches and administrators over the course of the next few years. Um, uh, in addition, uh, there, uh, there's um, a provision in there uh, in, in section four for uh, educational prep programs to align their, uh, their reading courses and their curriculum for uh, 
pre-service teachers with the science of reading. And um, that's something that uh, they'll be working on soon. Okay. Um, in section three, there, uh, there are two provisions. Um, and, and it's interesting because these are two things that we've already actually been working on. Uh, DHHS and, and NCDPI have been collaborating on a project called the Transition to uh, Kindergarten Pilot, that, that initiative. Um, this law really kind of solidifies uh, some of what we've been doing there. So first of all, um, there, uh, there is a requirement to ensure that a form of assessment is uh, administered to children in the NC Pre-K program at the end of the year, of course, currently um, there, uh, DHHS has been providing teaching strategies gold to all NC pre-K classrooms. And we're actually working on also providing uh, uh, teaching strategies gold to public school pre-K classrooms that, are, that do not utilize NC pre-K funding. And there's about 900 of those classrooms. So, um, uh, but this, you know, obviously this just speaks to an, an end of program assessment. Uh, but we, we uh, HS, DHHS and DPI are working together to put, put the DC teaching strategies gold as an ongoing assessment throughout the year in place. Um, so you'll see this. The next one is um, to ensure the results of that formative assessment, that that information is shared with a child's kindergarten teacher when they transition from pre-K to kindergarten. Again, that's that's something that has already been in process, and this just, you know, uh, better solidifies that by uh, by putting it into law. Um, and go to the next slide. Okay. All right. So in this section, um, this section is, is a reporting piece. So this, uh, this is a, a, something that the Department of Public Instruction in consultation with DHHS, we will uh, need to report to the Joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee. Um, the, the number of teachers, NC Pre-K teachers and administrators uh, that have participated in the uh, literacy science of reading training. Um, and then we'll also have to report beginning in the, um, I believe it's the fall of 2022, the results of the formative assessment that is provided to children at the end of their NC Pre-K uh, program year. And they want us to include the number and percentage of students who are demonstrating kindergarten readiness and students who do not demonstrate kindergarten readiness. Um, the kindergarten, kind of what kindergarten readiness is, is not defined in the law. And so we uh, will be working and collaborating with DHHS to determine, you know, what, uh, what those metrics will be um, and what will be reported to the uh, JLOC committee. Uh, there and I, feel, I believe it's in the fall of 2022. Yeah, it's September 15th. There we go, right at the top. If you go to the next slide, ah, oh, that slide. Questions? Actually, I do have one more, um, one more that I'd like to talk about. It's a slide that we uh, we meant to include, and we we went ahead and added it to a slide deck just in case you asked us to run because you said you were having trouble putting our slides in the presentation. And so um, I don't have a slide for it, but uh, Section 10 of the law also requires, requires DPI to create a uniform template for all the data collected for READ to achieve, starting back from 2013-14 school year all the way up through the current year. Um, we're, we're still seeking a little bit of clarification on that because there's an annual report that provides all of that data, which is 30, 40 pages long each year. Uh, and it includes not just uh, a, a statewide aggregate look, but it also looks at uh, each individual school district. Um, what I think they're looking for, what we think they're looking for is more of a, just at the state aggregate level, so they can kind of look at, uh, you know, uh, the trend over those years up until this year um, on a much, uh, you know, smaller report. Um, and then uh, you'll see the, the next one is related to, oh, you don't see, I see, it's on my screen. The next one's related to EVOS data. So um, they want also um, a, uh, a uniform kind of template to report EVOS data 
um, and that that same template obviously will be just added to each year to show um, uh, that data that's collected using the diagnostic, the form of diagnostic reading assessment. Can you remind me what EVOS is again? Sorry, Dan. Yeah, it's the it's it, EVOS is is like the it's it's the uh, student accountability data system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jenny, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry that you had trouble getting in. Can you can you hear us? <laughs> if you had anything to add, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to do that. I know you're joining us by phone. Hey Mary, this is Casey. I just wanted to double back on um so Dan, the EVOS system is not the student information system. It's the staff evaluation system. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm that's sorry. Okay. That's okay. That's, that's all right. Yeah. I just want I, I could see, I could hear, see. So um, yeah, our student information system is PowerSchool. And, yes, uh, and, yes. Yeah. Thank but you. EVOS. I, I know, I know yeah. this. I, I know I, you yeah. know this. Of I course know you this. know this. <laughs> that's why I got invited, <laughs> just to tell you what I you know. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. Sure. No problem, Dan. Uh, any other questions for Dan and Jenny? Um, thank you for that presentation. Sure. Well, if you must, you might be hiding under a rock if you haven't what you haven't been following all of the work that's happening around K-3 literacy in our state um, and the science of reading. And we know that this is an important act and there's going to be a lot of data requirements that will come out of it. And it's, thank you for sharing this overview. Um, good luck to you on your work preparing for this. And um, we look forward to hearing maybe a little bit more in the fall to see where, what you've kind of come up with in that planning. Um, so thank you for your time today, Dan and Jenny for preparing the presentation. My pleasure. All right, if there's no other questions, we'll just continue on with our last and final presenter, but not least by any means. Vicki Kreis is joining us from the um, from NC Child, and she's just going to share briefly about their 2021 county data dashboard. And um, Vicki, I have made you a co-host, um, which should allow you to share your screen with us. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, hello everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and I'll only take a few minutes. Um, but at NC Child, every year, um, you all may know that we release our annual county data cards. These data cards um, share data across 15 key indicators of children's health and well being. And this year, we're really excited um, to, for the first time, launch an interactive data dashboard that reflect these data. Um, but do so with data disaggregated by race and ethnicity so that we can have a fuller understanding of what's happening among kids in North Carolina. Um, and so you can see here, if you access our website, um, you can just go to ncchild.org forward slash data um, and you'll be able to find the link to the county data dashboard. One thing is that we also released our regular static PDF county data cards for you to print uh, easily and share in your community if that's something that's helpful. Um, but alongside those, um, as I shared, we released this interactive data dashboard. Um, one of the things that's been mentioned a few times on this call and that we know as people who work in data is that it's so important um, for us to contextualize our data, right, and to talk about root causes for some of the disparities we see, particularly when we're looking at um, indicators by race and ethnicity. So we have the um, five areas um, that we look at in our um, traditional county data cards, a strong start, so the first 2,000 days of a child's life, um, so we're looking at birth outcomes, um, we also look at family economic security. Um, and you can see here as you um, switch from each tab, you can also switch across counties. Nurturing homes and communities, high quality education and health and wellness. Um, and also the first tab is always gonna be that demographics data. So if you're interested in taking a look at that at the county level, you can do that. If you scroll down more, you can see the statewide data dashboard is separate just because of how Tableau public works. Um, we had to separate those out, but um, same thing. You can explore all 15 key indicators um, by race and ethnicity at the state level. 
And then um, back at the top, you'll see the link to the data sources. Um, so if you're interested in exploring where we pulled this data, um, you can do that there. But our hope is that um, given that our county data cards are our most used data resource at NC Child, that this dashboard will also be really helpful to advocates. Um, and particularly with, you know, the different ways that we contextualize each indicator, that that hopefully is another helpful tool for folks as they, you know, take on advocacy for these different indicators that we know are so important. Um, but that's really it. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Thank you, Vicki. I'll get back to your, my screen here. Does anybody have any questions for Vicki about the data dashboard we included? We just popped the, the link to the county data dashboard in um, the chat for you to visit on your own. Vicki, does this dashboard get updated every year or is it ongoing? Yes, um, we'll be updating it once a year, um, probably in December or January, um, just because that's when we can get, you know, the um, American Community Survey five-year estimates at the county level. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say, you know, all of the data is pre-pandemic um, because of that, you know, data lag with our state and, and federal um, data reporting system. But um, we also have um, access to our Kids Count Data Center. As you all may be familiar, the um, Census Household Poll Survey data, um, which is a survey that was conducted during the pandemic um, on a weekly basis. And so if you all are interested in exploring how families have been faring during the pandemic, um, you can find that data as well on our website. Thank you. I appreciate just you mentioning again the contextualization of each of the measures as a, as a place for advocates to go. I think that's really important, especially even hearing from Dr. Aruka again mention that again. Um, it's an incredible resource. Thank you for sharing with us today. I hope each of you, if you haven't already, will have a, a chance to go and check it out um, and share it with your communities as well. All right, we are going to move ahead. Thank you, Vicki. Appreciate it. I just wanted to leave just a few minutes for any updates that the council members had um, that they want to share just quickly with the group. I know you all are working on different things. We won't meet again for another couple months. So um, now's the chance to just let us know about some things you're working on or want us to know about. All right, not hearing anything, we can finish up. So our next steps. We um, have agreed to move forward on the affordable high quality child care measures as the next two in our data development strategy. And I think we talked about um, some folks gave us some suggestions of people to reach out to. Some of you mentioned that you'd be interested in maybe working on a, on a work group. Uh, over the summer months to maybe uh, bring forward some more information at our next meeting. So I will be reaching out to you and the people you suggested. And if you want to shoot me an email and let me know that you're interested in that, that would be great. Um, we also agreed to just continue exploring what the work of the council might be around um, North Carolina's early childhood data in COVID-19. And so we'll also do some more thinking about that and maybe come um, have some more discussion in September and maybe a, a survey this summer to gather some more information from you. If you have any feedback you want to share with Paul Lanier and his team about those data, um, the data that they've reported on and some of the implications that you want to add to based on your expertise, please do that. Um, we will also just look at our notes for other action steps in those areas. Our next meeting will be on September 15th at the same time. You should already have a calendar invite for that. As you all are probably doing it within your own agencies and uh, organizations, we are thinking about whether we should make the step into in-person meetings. For those of you who've been with us for a while, we used to meet at the Department of Health and Human Services Adams Building, I think, and I believe they will begin resuming meetings in July. This meeting is in September. So um, we really um, 
I guess all can appreciate the benefits of meeting in person for relationship building and also the convenience of Zoom. So we're going to just put forward a poll to the group as we close. And um, we would love your feedback on whether you would like to meet virtually or in person for our meeting in September. And then also just a, a question about um, our meeting today. You just take a minute to respond to that. Just a couple more seconds to get those last folks in with their votes. All right. 76% of you have voted and it looks like we have a slight preference for virtual 67% of those of you that are here. Um, so we will plan for that. And here we go. Final vote, 67% for virtual. It's close, um, but we will plan for a virtual meeting and maybe think about what our next one could be. And it looks like folks felt like this was a good use of their time. So thank you for that feedback. And we are finished. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we hope you have a great long weekend and summer and look forward to connecting with you again. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thanks, Mary.